Today's COVID update is brought to you by Fultech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. And welcome back to Open Your Eyes on this lovely Wednesday morning. We're now moving into our first segment for today. It's actually uh, taking a look at the mid-season, mid hurricane season actually, and predictions. Now to tell us more, we have in with us Ronald Gordon, who is uh, at the National Met Service uh, of Belize, who is from. He's actually the Deputy Chief Meteorologist. I got that correctly right, Mr. Gordon? That's right. Yes, I'm glad. I'm glad. Good morning, sir. It's always nice to have you in. We know the situation as it is, and uh, we're, for the most part, uh, while we're cognizant of the hurricane season, we continue to pray uh, that our country is not struck by them. Now let's get on into it. Uh, we're in basically mid-season of the hurricane season. Um, things to me, uh, looking at, looking at what, what had occurred earlier, earlier this year, got started very, very, very early. Before we jump on into the hurricane season, I'd like to know what a hurricane is. How do we de de determine what a hurricane is, sir? Okay, um, a hurricane is defined as an area of low pressure in the tropics uh, with a closed circulation. By that, it means that the winds are actually going around within basically a circle, uh, but entering towards a center of low pressure. Um, and it has to be in the tropics, and it's what we call a warm core system as opposed to the um, mid latitude systems that are also areas of low pressure, but they are the center of it is colder than the surrounding air. So mm -hmm. a hurricane is actually a warm core system in the tropics, and um, those winds have to be 75 miles per hour and, and over for it to be defined as a hurricane. Where do they okay. come from? How, how, how are they formed? Mm -hmm. Okay, hurricanes um, in our area typically form from disturbances within the easterly flow. Mm -hmm. So what you have for our area, the, the most, um, the, the major factor from which they form are tropical waves. Um, you have these tropical waves that come off the coast of Africa and um, whenever they enter the Atlantic Ocean and, and they encounter those warm waters, uh, you have the thunderstorm concentrating around a, a, a very small area mm -hmm. and you develop an intense low pressure and you get the wind circulating. However, um, hurricanes, tropical systems can also form from other disturbances in the, in the tropics, mm -hmm. including from the tail end of cool fronts at the end of the season. Wow. So uh, let's let's talk about how 2020 is shaping up. Um, the first projection um, or prediction for this season is looking at an above average um, season. However, there's a, a mid-season assessment that's done, and that was released earlier this month, saying that it's not going to be above average. It's going to be extremely active. Uh, Mr. Gordon, go ahead and, and just explain to us what that means. Okay. Um, this season is uh, basically reminiscent of what we had in 2005, which was an extremely active season. Um, to summarize what we've had so far, uh, we had 11 EM storms so far and yeah. two hurricanes. Um, the updated prediction from the Colorado State University, which is one of them that we monitor closely, is indicating to us that we can have up to 24 named storms this season. So that would indicate to us that we have at least 13 more named storms. Mm -hmm. And of those named storms, they're forecasting at least 12 to become hurricanes wow. and five to become major hurricanes. To put that in perspective, yeah. the normal season, using the average from 1981 to 2010, we typically have 12 named storms, so they are doubling the amount Double. for this year in the forecast. Wow. That's right. Yeah. And then in terms of hurricane, we normally have six hurricanes, and also they are forecasting 12, so that's double. And mm -hmm. even in terms of major hurricanes, the average is about two, and the forecast is for five. Yeah. So they're, they're, what are the factors that they look at um, halfway through the season to be able to determine what the other half is going to look like? Okay. Um, they looked at what happened already, of course, because having um, knowledge of what has occurred could indicate to you what to, will come in the future. Yeah. But apart from that, they also looked at the factors such as um, the sea surface temperature in the Atlantic Basin. Yeah. As um, To give you a bit of idea, a hurricane, I mentioned it earlier, requires warm sea surface temperatures. It's basically the fuel 
that fuels the um, system. Mm -hmm. So in the months of June and July, when they measured, when we have satellites that measure the sea surface temperature in the Atlantic Basin, it indicated that it, those temperatures are much warmer than normal. Mm -hmm. So that's a that's already a positive ingredient for storms to form. Mm. The next major factor that we have been looking at is the fact that uh, what we call wind shear. Mm -hmm. For a hurricane to develop and intensify, it requires that the winds within the different column of the air as they go up are not counteracting each other. Mm. So when we talk about wind shear, we are talking about opposing winds. Mm -hmm. You have a wind probably from the east at the lower level, and you have a strong wind from the west that would typically break the hurricane apart, basically. You can imagine it, right? Mm -hmm. Something is, is tearing the system apart. Yeah. So when you have light wind shear, as we're looking at at the moment, for most of the Atlantic Basin, the storms are able to form within a, 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 what we call a, a vertical coupling, basically. The system is in stock from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you have the, the storm can intensify more. Mm -hmm. So what is causing that low wind shear? Well, the major factor that is enhancing the low wind shear is the fact that we have an ill uh, we are La heading Nina. towards la nina situation in the in the yeah. pacific last year when we had a drought we had an el nino yeah. and in that case at the opposite you have strong wind shear so the storms cannot develop you have less rainfall yeah when you have la nina you have the opposite situation you have lighter wind shear mm -hmm. and the systems can develop and intensify now, I, I really wanted to ask this question because I, I did read up and, and, you know, we talk, we hear a lot about El Nino and then specifically this season being attributed to activities of La Nina. Please, Mr. Gordon, explain to us, who is she? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the El Nino, and I'll give you an idea why the name came up okay. as El Nino. Okay. El Nino is basically a phenomenon in the Eastern Pacific mm -hmm. Ocean whereby you have warmer than normal sea surface temperatures. So I'll start with an El Nino. When you have an El Nino in that side of the ocean, it typically um, creates a scenario over South America, whereby you have um, colder ocean water upwelling to the surface. And with that colder open ocean water in the, in the Pacific coast of South America, it tends to bring um, a lot of nutrients for uh, uh, the fishes and so on. Uh -huh. So the fishermen going out into that area to fish, and it normally happens around Christmas. So the fishermen going out to that area had a bounty of, of um, fi um, fishes, of fish to cut, to catch. Mm -hmm. So they said um, they, it's like a blessing. So they call it in El Nino, as in the Christ Child. Oh. That's how the name came up. Okay. Yes. Okay. But for me, for the purpose of meteorology, um, for us, it indicates to us that when you have an El Nino, uh, you have more prominence developed in the central and eastern pacific ocean i'm not talking about the coast of south america anymore yeah. i'm talking about the the area um in the tropical belt you have warmer than normal sea surface temperatures and in that case you have more storms developing on that side of the ocean and whenever a storm form it needs to ventilate air from the top it's like imagine this column of air rushing up from the bottom going up to the top uh-huh when, when it reaches what we call the trouble path, that's where it cannot go go any further mm -hmm. um it's then the, the, the wind tends to spread out Mm -hmm. And as it spreads out, it, it releases that strong wind at the upper level of the air that comes over to our side. And as I mentioned a bit before, it tears our system apart. Mm -hmm. So you have strong thunderstorms and storm over that side. And over our side, you have less storms because those strong winds that are coming off are basically destroying the storms that can form on this side. Mm -hmm. No, the opposite of that is La Nina, what mm -hmm. we are having now, or what we are projected to happen. I shouldn't say no. We're yeah. still relatively neutral. But the forecast for uh, going into the active part of the season is trending towards La Nina. Mm -hmm. La Nina is when you have no whole of the surface temperatures on that side. So less mm -hmm. vertical wind shear, as I mentioned, and mm -hmm. now you have more storms developing on our side. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's no force coming from the Pacific side to help to break up any hurricanes that forms on our side of the Atlantic. Exactly. Okay. That's a nice way to put it. So. so what, so what, what, what steers the hurricane? Because for the most part, you watch the projected path and then you wonder, uh, you know, sometimes it goes directly over countries or like, for instance, Bermuda. You see a country like Bermuda and anything forms in that particular area whereby uh, the, the storm comes off the coast of Africa and decides, OK, we're going west, northwest, and then from there we'll, uh, we'll head due north. For the most part, Bermuda is always in, in, in those cones. What steers the hurricane? Or the system sure um i wish i had a graphic to show at the moment but um 
you could imagine that you have this very broad circulation that we call an anticyclone. Basically, it's rotating clockwise, mm -hmm. right? So we call it the Bermuda High. And as you mentioned, Bermuda, because it's normally, normally located or centered near where Bermuda is, but sometimes it shifts further east um, during the hurricane season, especially. So you have this clockwise rotation, basically. And then at the periphery of that clockwise rotation where it begins to turn north, it's around the area of Bermuda. Mm -hmm. So imagine that rotation and it's spinning north. So the hurricane is, is being steered by that circulation. And therefore, it, um, when it's over, let's say, the Atlantic, the tropical Atlantic off the coast of Africa, it's coming due west because if you imagine the clockwise rotation, it's going, um, it's like the rotation from a clock, but it's going that way in that particular case. At the, let's say the, um, the six o'clock position of the clock, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's like going west. And when it encounters the three o'clock position, it starts going. Uh, is it three o'clock? Sorry, I'm, I'm getting my mask confused here. Uh -huh. It'll be nine o'clock. It will be nine o'clock position. Yeah. It starts turning, uh, turning north. Yeah. Okay, that's where the report the choppers. So that's basically the steering pattern of most terms. But then that doesn't always that isn't always the case. That Bermuda high shifts from time to time. Mm -hmm. So if it comes farther south or farther west towards us, then the storms will tend to come more into our area. Yeah. Wow. And so where is it for this season? Help us understand. <laughs> uh, currently, the Bermuda High is actually located in its climatological position. It's a bit further west than normal. So you see the systems coming across and entering the Caribbean. It's because it's a bit more west than normal yeah. than it should than it, than it normally is. You know, there's, there's, there's so much science um, behind this, and I know that you're, you're breaking it down for us this morning. Um, but, but I wanted to move away from the science just for a bit and look at, at what happens in being able to speak about what is predicted and also kind of keep that sense of urgency but also calm with the public. And everyone relies on the Met Service as soon as we start to hear of a storm as most people are doing since we've discussed uh, the systems that are out there, we start paying attention to the Met Service. Talk to me about internally how um, you try to ensure that you're able to give the most accurate information, but also keeping the range of possibilities as the science allows um, as a part of the conversation. That's a very good question and I, I, I'm happy to answer that. Um, first of all, in terms of what, what we do to keep the public informed, um, we have a well-trained and competent staff of uh, forecasters and meteorologists here. Yeah. We ca we are constantly monitoring the weather situation. We look at, we rely on um, both internal modeling that we do here at the Met Office, and of course, we rely on the global models that are out there. There are several global models that are always outputting information. Yeah. And um, I know that most Belizeans are now aware of the National Hurricane Center, and most yeah. people go to their website. Mm -hmm. um, what we rely on the National Hurricane Center is because the National Hurricane Center is de designated by the World Meteorological Organization. We have a body that we respond, we respond to. So the National Hurricane Center in Miami is not a center for the United States alone. They, are, they have that responsibility that is given to them by the WMO to monitor hurricanes for the entire region, which includes Central America, the Caribbean. Okay, mm -hmm. so that is the reason why they are the official source of information when it comes to telling us where the storm is, yeah. what is the potential for a storm to form. We rely on that source of information yeah. from the National Hurricane Center. And we, um, our forecasters, everybody up here gets an opportunity to go to the National Hurricane Center and um, for a training up there and work along with the uh, meteorologists on that side to, um, to see how they do their forecasts mm -hmm. and get that expertise also. So okay. those are some of the things that we do to prepare ourselves. And you mentioned something important, the uncertainty that we need to um, tell the public. Yeah. We always need to emphasize to the public that a model that is predicting the, um, a system is one possibility out of a range of possibilities. Yeah. So whenever we look at one particular model, there's always a range of models um, along with that that we need to, to, to look at. Mm -hmm. So there's always some uncertainty because the weather cannot be predicted exactly. Yeah. I know that the public would like us to give them exact information is it going to rain at three o'clock over my house and that type of thing? It's not possible, right? Yeah. It's what we are doing is using the best science that we have with the best technology that we have to give you an approximation. And that is what 
comes about in terms of when you look at the hurricane and there's the projected path and you see there's a cone of uncertainty yeah where, where the hurricane can be within that um within that thing within that cone so what we try to emphasize to the public is that you don't focus on the center of that cone yeah you don't you don't know if the hurricane is going to be there in that center it could be anywhere within that yeah. cone that is what that quote is trying to tell you that yeah. there's a range of possibility that there's some uncertainty the narrower the cone is then there's more certainty yeah the wider the cone becomes there's less certainty more uncertainty and if you notice as you go out in time the cone tends to expand yeah because as you would imagine the farther out you're away from a system there's more uncertainty with that system more changes yeah. that can happen are, yeah exactly and, and I just, you are, you better you can put it. Go ahead, Marlene, sorry. I know, I just wanted to be clear to people, this is not a current map, this is a map from 2017 to explain the cone before anybody tunes in and gets worried. But, but what's key, though, is when we talk about that cone especially, I know I have the habit as well, um, and it's just been through to talking with people like you, um, that even the top of the cone, what, what it actually predicts is the center of the storm, not the full storm, right? Yes, the, the, anywhere in the cone, any point in the cone would be the center of the storm. Yeah. So the, the center of the storm at a certain location, a certain point in time, could be anywhere in that cone. Yeah. And as you uh, rightly mentioned, it's not the size of the storm. So people tend to get the impression the storm is getting bigger yeah. as time goes along. Yeah. It's not the size of the storm. It's more a cone that's telling you the uncertainty. The uncertainty is getting bigger as time goes, not the size of the storm. Yeah. So, so in terms of the second half of the hurricane season, I think at the first, the first half, if I'm not uh, mistaken, you did mention that we had how many hurricanes so far? We had nine no named storms. Nine, nine named storms, and that's for just the first part of the hurricane season, right? The first half. No. A correction, we had actually we have eleven. We're when at eleven now. Oh. Yes, eleven. When the forecast came out that you were probably reading, it was nine. Okay. But okay. since August, we had two more. Okay. So we have had eleven named storms and two hurricanes from those names terms. Mm -hmm. What is the expectation for the second half? Uh, we know that the hurricane season is June to November. We're in August, August 19 to be exact, just about the half the halfway point. We also know that September is actually the peak of things. What are we expecting between now and November? We expect things to ramp up. Hmm. So we're approaching the, the peak of the season. As you know, the, climat the climatological peak of the hurricane season is around September 10th. Tent. So things are beginning to um, heat up at the moment, and that's what we're expecting. Okay. So if you look at the numbers, we have had 11, and the prediction is for 24. Right. So we're, we, we could expect about at least 13 more storms. And in terms of hurricanes, we have only had two hurricanes so far. Mm. So yeah. if, the prediction, if the prediction holds true, we could have 10 hurricanes forming between now and the end of November. And the, the, the one that I want to emphasize here is major hurricanes. Yes. We haven't yeah. had any so far. A major hurricane is a hurricane of category three and higher. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about wind speeds of about 130 miles or so. But I don't have the numbers exactly in my head right now, but yeah. around that area or more. So um, there could be five major hurricanes left in the hurricane season. So that means we need to be on the lookout. Yeah, but when you uh, when you talk about the the peak of the season, it's it's also about um, where these storms develop at this time of year. That's why we, we have to be more vigilant, right? Can you explain that for us? Well, for us here in Belize, our um, peak would be September, October. Okay. And um, the storms, where do actually do develop uh, in, the term, in the month of August would be off the coast of Africa, mm -hmm. what we call the Cape Verde um, season. Mm -hmm. So that's a typical um, development of position, but that doesn't mean where it developed doesn't uh, correlate to where it makes landfall. Okay. You've got to have a storm developing in the Atlantic and moves across into the Caribbean, as you have seen many times. Yeah. So the development a developmental area doesn't um, correlate exactly with where the storm will make landfall or where, where it, will, it will go. Okay. But, then, but, but to repeat, yes, the favorite area at this time in August would be off the coast of Africa. And as you move later on into the season, the um, area for hurricane genesis, as we call it, shifts more towards the Northwest Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so while, while, we are, while we're at that, um, you know, one of the things that we were talking about, especially well, during the commercial break, before we put you on, is actually the job, the job on a whole. And we're at a point whereby people are actually uh, finding, finding themselves interested in, 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 in various jobs that we've got in this country. 
Um, in terms of metrology or meteorologist and uh, hydrologist, you are a... Meteorologist. I'm a meteorologist. All right, so you're a meteorologist. Let, let, let's get a, a quick explanation for this because we, we listen to these folks every day while, while we do a call-in and uh, we probably get to see them once in a while. Um, what is the difference between a meteorologist and a hydrologist? And what's the difference there? And talk to us about the job. Okay. Um, first of all, I'll talk about the difference. A uh, meteorologist is someone who studies climate and weather. Mm. Yeah, so we are concerned with atmospheric phenomena, um, whether it be rainfall, hurricanes, uh, cold fronts, and that type of thing. A hydrologist, on the other hand, is someone who focuses on um, water once it has hit the ground. So hydrology focuses on things like rivers, uh, groundwater, and that type of thing, where the water is going. And they will be the ones who will be able to tell you whether um, a certain river base will flood and that type of thing. So that is the era of hydrology. Mm -hmm. Meteorology is weather and climate. That's our focus. Um, and in terms of becoming a meteorologist in this country, well, somebody who has that ambition or has that goal in mind should be someone who focuses on the science subjects. Okay. Um, in high school, we emphasize physics, uh, mathematics, um, even computer science, because there's a lot of programming involved in terms of um, developing models yeah. that forecast um, weather. So those three subjects would be your emphasis. And when you move on to this firm, it should also be your emphasis, physics, mathematics, um, anything to do with computer programming and that type of thing. And um, we at the National Health Service, and in the we are part of the government service, a part of the public service. Mm -hmm. A person can be hired here with a high school diploma if they have the requisite qualification, which is high school with um, mathematics, um, English language, and one science subject. Mm -hmm. we, for our part, we prefer physics as that science subject because, again, the study of weather is based on physics. Okay. After you've been hired here, and I came here from uh, high school, you could actually continue your education, study further, and there's a lot of opportunity in this field um, for onward, um, from, uh, to move upward. Yeah. So after that, we have several different levels that you go. Uh, you can go uh, do a six months and eight months course in, at the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology in Barbados. That will give you a certificate as what we call a class three um, met officer. And then you move on to a class two, which is a forecaster. That's another 18 months of study. Um, a lot of um, physics and mathematics and dynamics of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to become a meteorologist, you need to get a degree. Mm -hmm. So you go to the university. We typically go to the um, to UA, University of the West Indies in Barbados, and you get a degree for a study for about three years. And then you qualify as a meteorologist. Wow. Yeah. Those are the steps that people normally take to become. But we yeah. have had people um, hired here directly from, from university. So it doesn't mean that you have to come here with a high school diploma and yeah. vote the rank. You can go and do your study, pursue your study in meteorology, and be hired here um, directly from university. I appreciate that breakdown. I think it really helps people in terms of looking at uh, meteorology as, as a career path and something that they can grow into as well. But, um, you know, so you, said you have five meteorologists, you said, and two forecasters. That's the number you, you told us? Uh, currently, we have four meteorologists four. and two forecasters. Okay. And stuff. And um, I, I wanted to talk just a bit about resources because one of the things we knew from earlier this year is that the Doppler radar was not functioning. Um, have you made any progress in being able to, to get it fixed, especially as we head into the peak of the season? Okay, before I mention the Doppler radar, um, I know it's a very important uh, tool that we use to, predict, um, to help us to monitor a system that is almost at landfall on Belize. Yeah. But I want to clarify a couple of points about it. Before I, I will, I will answer your question. But before I do that, um, the Doppler radar cannot be used to monitor storms coming off the coast of Africa. That's a yeah. misconception that is out there in the public. So, for example, the system that is out there at, over the Eastern Caribbean, uh, it cannot be monitored with the Doppler radar, even if it was working. Yeah. We have a range of 400 kilometers. That radar can be used to pinpoint the center of the storm when it's already upon us. Mm -hmm. To put that in perspective, when the storm is 400 kilometers away, or in fact, with the accuracy of the Doppler radar, the, 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 the um, accuracy decreases as you go out in range. So not even the 400 kilometers would be an accurate pinpoint to pinpoint. It has to be within about 250 kilometers or so for us to identify that center properly. 
when the storm is that near to us, we are already in, in, in a warning. Yeah. So it wouldn't be the Doppler radar wouldn't help people to evacuate from one point to the next. Yeah. It would help us as a, uh, to, to identify maybe to tell you where the center mid landfall exactly. Yeah. But by then, everybody should have already been in a, in a, in a um, shelter or if they have to move. My point I'm trying to make is that we have other tools that we use yeah. to monitor hurricane. We have satellite imagery. We have um, com uh, computer models that we use that predict the hurricane. Of course, we have the hurricane center that is out there. They send the aircraft into the storm to monitor the location. Mm -hmm. So there are many tools that we use to monitor hurricane movement, development, apart from the radar. I am not downplaying the importance of the radar. Yeah. The radar is crucial for us when the system is all, if, if very near to us, for us to pinpoint the center and tell you exactly where those main bands are coming in. Yeah. In terms of what is happening with the radar, uh, we had a major um, uh, disruption earlier this year. Uh, we had we have been procuring parts. We had some parts coming to the country already. And when we installed those parts, we found out that there was other issues with the radar. So we had to go again and add more parts to the radar. But yeah. the National Health Service is working diligently to get the radar up. Yeah. And we hope to do so before the end of the hurricane season. We cannot guarantee that, but we do hope to get it up. We have we have a shipment of parts that came into the country over the past week, actually, and one came in just on Monday. Yeah. And then we still need two additional parts to come in um, before the radar can be up and functioning. But we are seeking to procure those parts. They are very expensive, by the way, but we are the government is supporting us, and we are getting those parts for the radar. I, I appreciate what you're saying. I know I know you don't want to to let anybody believe that without this radar you can't make your 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 predictions um or your forecasts i should say as as to uh when we are under the threat of a storm um but we do hope of course because we all enjoyed being able to see just that picture of belize in isolation versus uh what we would see from noah um so you're hoping that it can be it can be repaired um within the next month two months is that what you're saying I would give you a definite timeline, Marlene. Okay. Um, if I do so, I probably would not be. Um, <laughs> I couldn't be. I would be accurate. Um, okay. We are hoping for the best. It, with these type of things, whenever you get a part in and then you try it out, you find that something else is wrong. Yeah. So we are working on it. Our technicians are doing all the best they can to work on it. And we have, like I mentioned, we have the support. Government is supporting us in getting these parts into the country. We are doing all we can to get it up. But I cannot give you a definite okay. timeline on when it will be up. Okay. Now let's let's focus back on on what's out there at the moment. We we talked quite a bit about what the new predictions are, and and um, predictions are exactly that. But we just have to keep on paying attention. There are uh, two systems out there, and I want to ask from your perspective and from what we're seeing so far, um, what the threat is for us here in Belize. Okay, um, the system that is currently over the east of Central Caribbean Sea. Mm -hmm. Uh, the latest, um, the latest uh, forecast from the Hurricane Center has it at 40% chance of mm -hmm. developing in 48 hours and about 80% chance in five days. Um, the, I was looking at one of the models that we rely on a lot here, which is the global forecast system, mm -hmm. uh, typically called the American model. Um, the latest run from that model has been showing me that the system is going to move more towards the west than west-northwest at first. And there's a, there's a chance, based on that model, that the system will interact with the landmass of Nicaragua and Honduras. Mm. And that will tend to impede development if it makes that interaction. Uh, however, there's a possibility that once it makes that interaction, it will come across into the Gulf of Honduras. And there's a chance of it to strengthen slightly over the Gulf of Honduras into maybe a weak depression, uh, with a depression, I should say a weak depression, because we don't classify depression uh, before it comes across into our area. Um, we cannot say for certain where uh, it would make eventually make a landfall if it does develop. And like I said, there's the uncertainty. But you can look at anywhere between Belize and Yucatan Peninsula for the possibility yeah. of a landfall of a weak system. We're not expecting a major system at this time. Okay. Um, Will it potentially become a named storm, uh, or is it too early to tell? That possibility exists. Okay. That is within the range of possibility. Currently, the Hurricane Center is not mentioning named storm. They're mentioning tropical depression. Okay. However, um, as a just myself, I would see the possibility exists that something could um, develop into a near storm. Those um, sea surface temperatures, as we mentioned earlier, that are the fuel for hurricanes, are very warm right now over the North West Caribbean Sea, mm -hmm. and you could have something blow up in a, in a few, in, in very short time. So I would not discard the possibility that yes, we could have a near storm before the weekend is up. However, all indications are that it would be at most a depression at the moment. 
yeah. if it does, the yeah, depression, the major impact for us would be rainfall and the possibility of flooding from such a system. And that's always a, a part of the conversation, I think, um, that is worthwhile to discuss. That we have seen from tropical waves to trop tropical depressions right up to hurricanes, um, the water is really what causes a lot of the damage, and yeah. it depends on what are the factors that we, we should look at to be able to determine how much inundation we're going to be facing? Um, rainfall typically accumulate more when you have a slower moving system. So one factor, as you mentioned, as, as you talk about factor, one factor would be the speed of movement. Mm -hmm. If you have a system that sits over you for a long time, it will dump more rainfall as opposed to a fast moving system that rapidly moves across, would not dump as much rainfall. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the major factors. And then when you talk about rainfall, it's a, good, it's a good thing you mentioned that because we tend to focus on major hurricanes as being very destructive. Yeah. But from our experience, we have learned that you could have a very weak system, sometimes that even a depression, and it dumps a uh, tremendous amount of rainfall over you and get major flooding. So um, the point I'm trying to make is that it doesn't take a major hurricane for you to get devastation from flooding and rainfall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the speed of the system is one of the major factors that would contribute to the rainfall. Yeah, uh, you know what, uh, and TD16 is definitely one of those um, yeah. e examples. I think that was in 2008, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, looking at the system that we've got out there um, that's projecting a, to come in our area, um, what is the speed or is, the, is it moving fast or is it projected to move, start to slow down? What's going on there? Okay, um, currently it is moving fast and that's one of the reasons why it's not developing. Mm. Mm. Uh, the faster you have a system moving, I mentioned that now uh, in shear factor, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have the system moving fast at the lower levels and then at the upper levels it's not moving that fast, then the, 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 the bottom will tend to overrun the, um, the top. Yeah. So basically, it's like running, it's running away from itself, <laughs> so to speak. And that, that is hindering development at the moment. However, the projection is that um, as it enters the North West Caribbean Sea or the Western Caribbean Sea, it will slow down and then it will give it more. Um, and that will give it uh, a better chance of developing at wow. that time. Mm. So currently, it's moving at about 20 miles per hour. Okay. It's rushing towards the, towards the West. Yeah. Now, when we look back just a few years to uh, what or, or fellow Caribbean nations faced um, when they had back-to-back -back major hurricanes, um, devastated several islands and, and quite a lot of loss of life, one of the things we saw in that season, and I think we've seen subsequently, is how quickly these storms develop into major hurricanes. Um, you know, I, I think my, my best recollection is thinking about Mitch, how long it took, how slow it moved. But now, I mean, we're, we're looking at a matter of days, um, a named storm moves to, to a major hurricane. And always uh, reaching numbers where you hear them talking about possibly breaking a record for their intensity. What does that say about, about hurricanes and their formations now? OK. Um, before I answer your question, um, I also have one in mind. I was mm -hmm. Hurricane Keith in 2000. Yes. When you talk about rock rapid intensification that went from like a tropical storm to a major hurricane in a few in about 24 hours wow. so that occurs and it unfortunately for us it's something that happens a lot in the northwest caribbean sea where you have those very warm ocean temperatures mm. um you have the right ingredient you need two major ingredients for that well let's say three major ingredients a lot of moisture in the atmosphere mm -hmm. very warm sea surface temperatures that's the fuel that you need mm -hmm. and those are light winds at the upper levels where the system can actually ventilate Wow. And, and, and let out that air that is coming up from the surface. Those three factors, if they're in the right place at the right time, could lead to rapid intensification of a system. Mm -hmm. In terms of system intensifying rapidly now compared to the past, if there has been a change in that trend, I don't have the numbers in, in front of me um, to tell you yeah. that there's a trend in terms of that occurring so more, no more so than before. Okay. However, um, with, the, with climate change, right? Some of the projections that have been done using models have indicated that with warmer sea surface temperatures, you will tend to have more intense hurricanes. The projections do not indicate whether you will have more hurricanes in terms of the total amount. However, it does say that intensity of storms that do form will be more, uh, they will be more intense than, than in the past. So that would be a trend based on climate change projections. Yeah. 
And uh, talking about those right ingredients, uh, when, when do we see the warmest waters in front of the leaves? Oh, uh, late August, September. Those are the ones that you will see that um, those type of um, warm sea surface temperatures in front of us. You know, I, I, Ronald, you, you know, I'm sure um, that in the midst of everything we're going through, I think people waking up this morning and thinking about COVID, um, hurricanes may very well be uh, the last thing on our minds. Um, what do you say to people about being able to keep up um, the vigilance and monitoring and preparations? Okay, um, indeed, I wouldn't say hurricanes are the last thing on our minds. It's actually the first thing on our minds here at the mid service. Yeah. However, it's the last thing that we want to happen. Yeah. We, do not want, we do not want any hurricane. You know, we, we are dealing with so many things at the moment. Yeah. Um, we're dealing with the pandemic and COVID and that type of thing. And I know that it's stressful for everybody. So uh, we are hoping and we're praying that there's nothing coming towards us this year, but we need to be prepared. Yeah. The reality is a reality. Um, the forecast is indicating an above average season. Uh, the probability for us is once there's an above average season, the probability increases that you will have landfall in anywhere in the Atlantic Basin. So the probability is higher than any normal year. So uh, my advice to Belizeans is that you need to stay tuned. You need to keep monitoring I, um, the official sources of information. Um, we have the National Med Service. We coordinate with NEMO all the time. We're constantly vigilantly monitoring what's occurring in, in the Atlantic Basin. And we'll be, here, we'll be here to inform and advise the public on what action to take. Um, people should bear in mind and should be prepared, should have a plan. Actually, you should, we, we advise people to have a plan before the season starts. Yeah. And you revise the plan as the season goes along. Now, with um, the pandemic and all that in mind, your, your plan has to be adjusted to bear, to also factor, factor, to take into account the factor of the pandemic as well. So it's a tough situation, but we need to prepare. If we don't prepare, then we are born to arm. That's where the disaster comes in, no? Okay. Well, we do appreciate you taking the time to be able to break down for us uh, what this new prediction of extremely active means and what it means for us specifically here in Belize. Uh, we rely greatly on the work that you do there at the Met Service. And so we thank you and uh, best of luck and stay safe. Okay, and same to you. It's All my right. pleasure to be here. All right, thank you. Well, we are about to uh, take that commercial break, and when we come back, we'll be uh, venturing off into a conversation with a representative from the National Women's Commission on Victims' Complaint Mechanism. So stay with us. We'll be right back. This COVID update was brought to you by Foltex Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service.